opportunities in the North and, and reminding folks of the degradation in the South. The Chicago Defender is incredibly important as a tool to help people find the courage or find the resources or the, de or the determination to move North. And then you have service organizations like the National Urban League, founded in 1911, dedicated <coughs> to improving the quality of life or life chances for blacks migrating north. So you have, just in the first two decades, sort of an astonishing convergence of all these different forces that really help fuel this migration. The numbers are really quite striking. Just between, this is just to get a sense of things. You're not going to have to know this for the, for the, like an exam or anything. But looking at a few major northern cities between 1910 and 1920. It's so funny when I say you don't have to know this for the exam, the tapping stops. That's hysterical. Um, anyway, uh, you take New York City. In 1910, the popula African American population is around 90,000. Within 10 years, it's 150,000, an increase of 66 percent. In Chicago, um, the population increases by 100 and almost 150 percent from 44,000 to 110,000. Uh, in uh, Cleveland, population soars from 8,000 to 34,000, an increase of 300 percent. And in Detroit, the population goes from 5,000 to 40,000, uh, an increase of 600 percent. So are radical changes in just 10 year periods of time. This is the era when Harlem becomes known as a black enclave. Now, so we know about what was getting people out of the South. What did they find when they got to the North? Yeah, they could have their own apartments, certainly. Owning homes would take a little while for most migrants. But they would find segregated housing, de facto, not de jure, de facto. And segregated housing was bad housing, low quality, poorly maintained, sites of high levels of crime, vice, public health hazards. Anybody know um, Washington, D.C. that well, sort of the area? Um, well, Georgetown used to be, you know, a, a sort of a slum in, in the docks. But um, getting around, say, DuPont Circle and heading that area, a lot of townhouses around there, row houses. And um, in the area I'm talking about, you would go behind the row houses to the interior of the block in these alley dwellings. I mean, pestilence, horrible sites, horrible locations. This is where a lot of migrants black lived in the alleys in Washington, D.C. It's sort of the invisible to the public, but certainly there. Migrants to the North would find native black resistance, people who had been there already for generations, who thought these black migrants talked funny, dressed strangely, cooked food that smelled wrong, um, and were loud and boisterous and acted out in public. All these kind of racially coded things we certainly still live with, but you have uh, uh, long-term black communities deeply unhappy about these migrants coming up. You'd have people who had migrated just 10 years earlier uh, uh, unhappy about the new migrants because they're just making, they're embarrassing us, they're making, you know, the increasing job competition. Coming up was, was filled with challenges. You would also have, um, you know, an urban league trying to find people jobs. You would have um, <coughs> African Americans being brought up to a factory where a labor union, which blacks weren't allowed to join, a union being on strike, and the Urban League working with the, the, the company that owns the, the factory saying, factory owners saying, look, if you can get me, you know, 100 black men to work in the factory, that'd be great, I'd give them jobs. Well, they're hired as scab labor. So they are vilified by white labor workers. It's a job, certainly, as long as the labor union stays on strike, but it's a job at some pretty serious costs, as we'll see in this week's readings and in Wednesday's lecture. So, life wasn't easy. And you have to think about this tension between sort of 
black autonomy, the real power in being able to make a decision to leave town. You can't discount that. That's important. Sort of life-changing in a sense, just to get up and go. You have to weigh that against the reality of like life when you got to your destination might be pretty horrible as well. Certainly different than anything you expected. Yeah, you got paid more. Yeah, you had your own roof over your head. But the tenements in which blacks were living were just, I mean, horrible. I mean, the stuff beyond your imagination in so many ways. Uh, sure, you could ride where you wanted to on the bus, but there were still costs or risks involved in acting out, shall we say. Again, we'll see more of this in, next lec in the next lecture. Now, one thing I, I uh, also want to make clear before moving into sort of the next phase of the lecture is thinking about, you know, as we're trying to unpack what migration really was, <coughs> it's important to realize that migration wasn't just blacks working on the southern farms, all of a sudden, you know, in a week's time they're working in a mill in Chicago. No, it wasn't that. I mean, migration was, among many things, at least, I mean, it was at least very complicated. So you might have some working in the farm, the boll weevil attacks, there's no more opportunity to work. You'd, f you'd go to the city, southern city, trying to find a job, something. Cities became crowded. This is where labor agents would really, quote, steal. You would find a lot of people, hire them up to the north. But would they always go all the, all, quote, all the way to north Chicago, New York City? No, they wouldn't they might end up in the coal fields in West Virginia, or in Ohio, or in Kentucky. And they might work there for, you know, six months, and then go back home to Montgomery, just to pick a place. And then they might leave the next year for three months and then come back. Migration was not literally from field to factory in one straight direction. People were going back and forth often. They might get up to, you know, the mines, the coal mines in Kentucky, be there for a couple of years, and then make it to Chicago after that. And who knows how long they would stay. So you need to understand that, that, that migration is, doing, is moving in many different directions at once, although it was generally from field to generally to factory. One thing that's not ambiguous at all during this era is what I'll say the commerce of racism. Remember, whites didn't want to have blacks leave, or whites wanted blacks to leave at first and realized, wait, this would mess up our system, then don't want blacks to leave at all. Yet, they still treat blacks pretty shabbily um, in their southern towns and in their southern fields. One thing that is incumbent upon this sort of commerce and racism is control. Who's in control of society? It's a word I've used before. As society becomes destabilized by blacks moving on their own or with the help of labor agents, you start seeing a real rise in white resistance to the challenge of this system. White resistance to black autonomy becomes palpable. I already mentioned Southern resistance to labor agents coming down. It's important to understand there are other things that were developing within white America, white Southern America, that complicated the nature of black-white relations in the South, and that the most important force is the Klan, the KKK. Now, the Klan, you remember, was destroyed at the national level during Reconstruction. It starts to creep back during Redemption, but it's really, you know, as terrible, uh, terrifying as it is, something happens when you get to around the height of the migration, around 1915. The popularity of the Klan skyrockets. I mean, skyrockets. 
the fact that it's happening at the same time blacks are trying to leave the South in a real outflow is no coincidence. There's no doubt also that a large part of the Klan's popularity, reborn popularity, is a film, D.W. Griffith's film called The Birth of a Nation. This movie is based on a novel by a guy named Thomas Dixon, Dixon a novel called The Klansman. The book as well as the movie, and I'll only be talking about the movie, is a depiction of Reconstruction, but from a point of view that was entirely sympathetic to the Southern community. Southern mentality. The film was immediately controversial, it was explicitly racist, but there's no denying the fact that it was cinematically revolutionary. Casting aside the subject matter for a moment, it may be the most important film, most important American film of all time for the way in which it changed what was possible from a technical point of view. We have large outdoor scenes, the tracking shot, cat's eye lenses, fade-ins, color, or more like tenting, but still color, night photography, panning, close-ups, high-angle shots, and so forth. It was also the first feature-length film in uh, American motion picture history. So technically, it's an astonishing accomplishment. When it's shown at the White House, Woodrow Wilson, Southern Democrat, but also a scholar of some merit, declared that it was, quote, history written in lightning. He lauded it for its bold and accurate depiction of the past. Now, for the record, its only accuracy came in the fact that it represented a type of hysterical psychology that captivated Southerners who felt that they were victims of a war of Northern aggression. <coughs> so Woodrow Wilson celebrates this thing. This is, you know, this is an incredible historical document. It is an incredible historical document, but not for what it shows on this, not for the story that it tells, but for how it captures a mentality in the 19-teens and how it excites a populist, I guess, I guess, a populist base in white America and helps elevate membership numbers in the Klan. I mean, the film is hailed, and speaking of two sides of it, from a technical standpoint, Spike Lee ever the controversial artist, mm -hmm. talks about it as the most important <coughs> film that he's ever, I mean, it was so most important film for him. On the other side of it, in terms of, you know, what the film is really about, it's still used by the Klan today as a recruiting tool. <coughs> so it's not just this interesting silent movie from the 19 teens, it's still being used today. Now the basic storyline tracks the rise and fall of the South is told through the experiences of two different families. You have a family called the Stoneman, the Stoneman family from the North, and the Cameron family from the South. <coughs> so lifelong friends, both very powerful families, but divided by the Mason-Dixon line. A little bit of Romeo and Juliet to the story, in that the different sets of Stoneman and Cameron children are in love with each other. So the love crosses the, the Northern and South divide. And so the Stoneman's and Cameron stand in as metaphors for the entire North-South division. These are divisions that, these are parts of the country that should, should love each other. They are in one spirit in some way, but there's a fundamental rupture, and we need to solve that rupture. So the premise is that the Camerons, these are the Southerners, give three sons to the war. Only one survives, a guy named Ben, who then, then vows to avenge Southern dishonor, but he also happens to fall in love with, this makes it complicated, one of the Stoneman daughters, northern daughter. So the sole surviving southern male, 